Warning, the following video contains subject matter that might be difficult for some audiences, particularly those that do not put facts before feelings. Viewer discretion is advised. What do dog humping, Mein Kampf, and feminist astrology all have in common? They were all accepted as examples of exceptional research and scholarship by so-called academic social justice journals. What a time to be alive. And before you wave this off as some hokey attempt by right-wingers to dismantle identity politics, let me tell you a little something-something. The three researchers involved in this project all identify as liberals and humanists. This is not, as many gender studies academics have suggested, a coordinated attack by the right. So you can stick that in your feminist geography pipe and smoke it. So how did this happen? As Helen Pluckrose, James A. Lindsay, and Peter Bogosian put it, academia and scholarship has become more focused on social grievances rather than finding truth. Peer-reviewed science has become decreasingly scientific and more of a method to bully students, administrators, and the population at large into adhering to a specific worldview that is, again, largely unscientific. They set out to prove this over a year-long sort of sting operation where they submitted, quote, outlandish or intentionally broken papers to leading peer-reviewed journals to test the journal's rigor and biases. Basically, they took all the existing scholarly work, and I use that term loosely, and used it to support ridiculous but totally made-up conclusions. And they could do that, because so much of identity politics work out there is just ridiculous and has ridiculous conclusions. The difference is, the work that's already out there is serious and parades itself as real knowledge, while these 20 papers were pure sophistry on purpose. And no one at these journals could tell the difference. Of the 20 papers, four were accepted and already published online. Another three had been accepted but were not yet published when the trio pulled the plug. Overall, 80% of their papers went to full peer review and only six were rejected as fatally flawed. I don't know about you, but I find that really disturbing. And now what you've all been waiting for, a taste of what Project Sokol Squared actually managed to publish. And now, our feature presentation. The affectionately nicknamed Dog Park Paper, aka Human Reactions to Rape Culture and Queer Performativity at Urban Dog Parks in Portland, Oregon, started with the idea of writing a paper that suggested women can train men like dogs in order to prevent rape culture. Let that just percolate a moment. The paper aimed to view human-animal spaces and human and canine interactive behavioral patterns through something called feminist geography and black feminist criminology, as well as feminist, queer, and animaling lenses, the latter of which I cannot find a definition for anywhere, and yes, that is gibberish on purpose. In the paper, fake researcher Helen Wilson spent a year observing three dog parks in Portland and took fake notes about fake dogs and counted how many times these fake dogs either fought each other, humped each other, or raped each other with a very shoddy definition of rape, and then counted how many times their fake owners broke up the fights and fake rapes or picked up their fake poop. Fake Helen then recorded whether or not the fake dogs were male or female by personally inspecting the dog's genitals. In fact, she, quote, closely and respectfully examined the genitals of slightly fewer than 10,000 dogs. <coughs> In order to protect their identities, which is a very sensitive subject, she recorded only the first and last letters of their names and changed the color of their fur and any distinctive patterns. Further, she did not list the various breeds of the dogs in order to prevent stereotyping, though in the paper she admits that this left out a crucial factor of intersectionality. The, the reviewers are worried that we didn't respect the dog's privacy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the concern. Who respected the 
Her research came to the conclusion that only male dogs rape and that men will intervene in gay dog rape, but not in straight dog rape. However, when people intervened by using shock collars, yelling, or tugging on leashes, the rape incidents stopped. Fake Helen then reached two conclusions. The first, that all dogs, but especially female dogs, are oppressed, and dog parks pose a critical rape emergency to female dogs as dog parks are, quote, petri dishes for canine rape culture. And then, Two, that we should train men not to rape by yelling at them every time they approach a woman. The paper was accepted and published in Gender, Place, and Culture in May. But it wasn't just accepted and published, it gained special recognition for excellence and was honored as one of the 12 pieces for the journal's 25th anniversary celebration. Boy, do they look stupid. The paper has since been retracted, but only only after a Twitter account called Real Peer Review called some attention to it, which then led journalists to figure out that Helen Wilson wasn't real, which is finally what forced the trio behind it to reveal the hoax. But if it hadn't been for that Twitter account, they could have potentially gotten more and more papers published, because today's social justice culture has become so ridiculous that no one can tell the difference between satire and the real deal. Another paper called Going In Through the Back Door, Challenging Straight Male Homo Hysteria, Trans Hysteria, and Transphobia Through Receptive Penetrative Sex Toy Use, was published in Sexuality and Culture and suggested that encouraging men to explore anal penetration with dildos can basically act as a sort of conversion therapy to turn them into feminists and make them more accepting of gay and trans people. The reviewers and editors of the journal thought that this was a brilliant idea, even though conversion therapy is supposed to be bad. My personal favorite of the lot, titled Our Struggle is My Struggle, Solidarity Feminism as an Intersectional Reply to Neoliberal and Choice Feminism, literally rewrote Chapter 12 of Hitler's Mein Kampf to include feminist buzzwords. And that's it. It was published in Ophelia, Journal of Women and Social Work. The original Chapter 12 lays out why Hitler believed the Nazi party was needed and what would be expected of its members. The feminism version argues against what it calls choice feminism, basically allowing all women to make their own choices because it, quote, allows for sidestepping demanding political work of feminists to dismantle gender roles alongside other forms of oppression and focus on one's own pleasure and fulfillment. This is bad because choice feminists are shirking their duties to their gender and are thus perpetuating patriarchal oppression. The paper further argues that feminists should politicize sexuality, especially in young girls, in order to enact social change, which I personally find very creepy. In short, even if you're a feminist, making your own personal choices to have kids, marry, or be a stay-at-home mom is a betrayal to all women everywhere. Instead, women should unify for the greater good and focus only on the greater good and accept themselves as a universally oppressed class that needs to strike down men and remake society. And in Hitler's own words, no sacrifice is too great. The paper even goes so far as to take Hitler's 14-step plan and rewrite it into an 8-step plan to nationalize the right brand of feminism. Other papers made the argument for a new category of competitive bodybuilding called fat bodybuilding, in which participants would be judged on how much fat they can display. Yet another argued that when men masturbate while thinking of a woman, it is sexual violence and should be considered a sex crime. A third paper published in a journal called Sex Roles is best described as a gender scholar goes to Hooters and tries to figure out why it exists. It basically suggested that heterosexual attraction to women is inherently problematic because men. In the end, they found that just about any paper could be accepted by one of these grievance studies journals so long as it checked off enough buzzwords and promoted the fashionable and almost religious dogma of destroying privilege no matter how extreme the method. 
And this is the stuff that is now taught in today's colleges and universities. It's being used to design curriculums, to guide activists, and to decide how media is produced, and to influence public policy. And it's being masqueraded as an extension of the civil rights movement when really these studies are just exploiting it. The Sokol Squared Trio was able to get seven papers published in under a year. For most universities, seven papers in seven to ten years is enough to earn tenure. So these three were not only able to hoax journals just by using the right buzzwords, but were able to achieve the requirements for earning tenure and being seen as an expert in the field in less than a year, without any of them having a single degree in any of the fields that they published to. Which in and of itself points to the fact that none of these fields actually have any intellectual rigor or standards, and that at least 90% of the stuff that they produce, if not more, is pure nonsense. Academics are split down the middle on the project, with many saying the project was unethical or downright mean, which really just seems like they're trying to save face. They don't want to admit that there is a problem in the various identity and cultural studies, and they think that every piece that those fields produce must be good and sound just because they deal with social justice. But this project is proof that they're wrong. Things aren't just social constructs or problematic because you want them to be. And just because you find something problematic doesn't mean that it needs to be dismantled or disrupted at the expense of real science. But then again, many identity and cultural studies scholars believe for some bizarre reason that science and the scientific method are a phenomena that can only be accessed by white men. Which means that hard science is inherently racist and sexist and nothing is worse than being a racist or sexist. So naturally, these critics are calling the Sokol Trio every name in the book, proving the three's predictions that they'd be accused of being racist, sexist, bigoted, misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic, transhysterical, anthropocentric, problematic, privileged, bullying, far right wing, cis hetero straight white males, and one white female who was demonstrating her internalized misogyny and overwhelming need for male approval, who wanted to enable bigotry, preserve our privilege, and take the side of hate. And indeed, I've seen every one of those words used to dismiss their project, even the ones that Microsoft Word say aren't real words. And that viewpoint that anyone who disagrees is racist or sexist or privileged or just generally problematic is the exact viewpoint and confirmation bias that allowed this hoax to actually work. That's your Liberty Related News for the week. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Drop some comments down below as it really does help the channel and helps boost me up in the algorithms. And if you really like my videos and want to help support my channel, you can do so over at Patreon or through one-time donation through PayPal, Bitcoin, or Litecoin. Until next time, thanks for watching and helping me to spread the message of Liberty.